All right, I think we're ready to begin. Hi there. Uh, welcome to everyone who signed up for this special Google Hangout sponsored by the American Library Association and the Office of Information and Technology Policy. My name is Renee Hobbs, and I'm a founding director and professor at the Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island. Tonight, I'll be moderating a panel discussion with two distinguished experts, each of whom is exploring the question of assessing digital literacy. Um, tonight, we have um, uh, um, uh, just an hour, um, but we hope that you'll be able to participate by sharing your questions and your comments and your observations. You can do that if you're a Twitter user by using the hashtag Digilit12. That's spelled D I G I L I T 1 2. Or you can use the link at the District Dispatch uh, website at the American Library Association's um, site and put your comments in that way, uh, also via our, our YouTube page. Tonight, I'm just thrilled to be um, uh, joined by Karen Hansen, who's a program officer at the National Telecommunications Information Administration. Um, she's uh, one of the program officers responsible for the Broadband Telecommunications Opportunities Program, the $4.7 billion federal initiative designed to increase broadband opportunities to all Americans. Also joining us this evening is Dr. Julie Quiro, an assistant professor in the College of Education at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, uh, recently awarded the International Reading Association's uh, top researcher under 40 for her groundbreaking work in new literacies and especially in her work in measuring online reading comprehension. With her colleagues, she's involved in a four-year federally funded initiative to develop reliable and valid measures for online reading comprehension uh, for middle school students. And tonight, we think these two experts will give librarians and information professionals a, a new and fresh understanding of the way in which we're beginning to think about measuring and assessing programs that aim to support people's digital literacy competencies. But the first step in any program of measuring or assessing digital literacy is to define what it is. So I'll ask our panel members, what is digital literacy and how does your definition um, uh, shape the way you approach the challenge of measurement? Julie? Hi, Renee, and uh, hello to all of you out there. Um, in terms of my thinking about digital literacy, I come from a, an education background and so much of it has to do with academic school types of literacies and um, even if it's out of school just in the context of of learning and, and learners answering their own questions and so for me digital literacy really um, is defined as this sense of online reading comprehension that includes skills and strategies and dispositions for being able to use and adapt to a whole bunch of information and communication technologies that are constantly changing. Um, and so most of what I look at is the process of online inquiry and what kinds of skills and strategies are required. Um, for the most part, um, it's broken down into five components that looks at students' ability to read to identify important problems, reading to locate information, using the internet, reading to critically evaluate the information in terms of um, reliability, validity, relevancy, and point of view, reading and writing to synthesize information using the internet, and then finally once you find the answers to your questions, reading and writing to communicate that information to other people. Um, so that's pretty much in a, in a nutshell what I would define digital literacy as. Thanks very much for sharing that, Julie. And, and I think in some ways, librarians uh, completely recognize that paradigm, uh, identifying, locating, evaluating, synthesizing, and communicating. Because when patrons come to the uh, public library, or certainly in the context of school library uh, and academic libraries, that process is the essential uh, search 
and refine and use and evaluate and then do something with the information. Karen, how does how does your work at, in evaluating the BTOP programs, what's the BTOP uh, program's uh, definition of digital literacy? Well, I would, I would say that Julie really covered um, what is traditionally known as digital literacy very well. So I don't think there's a whole lot that I could add to that. The only thing I would say is, is that digital literacy is really fundamental. It's foundational to so much in our society these days. And so um, if, you, if you aren't digital, digitally literate, um, you are going to be cut off from public services as well as private services. So um, we, we see digital literacy as really a fundamental foundational skill and um, so it's to me personally it's also a matter of, of equity um, because as more and more of these services are going online if communities who are traditionally um, not online continue to be in that situation um, they will just fall further and further behind so it's a really it's a really important matter of, of equity um, so as you mentioned um, I am a program officer I work on public computer center and sustainable broadband adoption grants it's a mouthful um, and I'm also the program the project manager for the BTOP evaluation which is being conducted by evaluators um, by the name of ASR analytics and um, actually we just posted the study design um, that they came up with and um, as well as the first interim report on our website um, so what they're doing is looking comprehensively at the BTOP portfolio. As you said, it's $4.7 billion. Uh, the, the majority of that actually went to building out infrastructure. So middle mile, um, fiber, really literally digging trenches. But a significant portion, $450 million, went to these public computer center and sustainable broadband adoption grants. Lots of libraries in our portfolio. Um, one of my grantees is the New Jersey State Library Association. Um, so, you know, we do, we have served um, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in six million training hours. So, um, a real, real, really critical part of the BTOP uh, PCC and SBA grants, as we call them, is to promote digital literacy. Um, so, I, I'll go into the uh, evaluation a bit later, but that's, that's my intro. <laughs> That's actually pretty useful because that gives us a big picture overview of the project and the, um, the role that program evaluation plays in it, um, especially the $450 million dedicated to providing those services to help people develop the skills and competencies they need to be able to use the new broadband that's coming into uh, communities all over the United States. Julie, can you give us a bit of a big picture perspective on the project that you've been working on for the last four years and what the aims and goals of that initiative are? Sure. Um, the short name for our project is called the ORCA project. It doesn't really have anything to do with ORCA whales. <laughs> ORCA stands for Online Research and Reading Comprehension Assessment. And it's, a, um, it's actually turned into a five-year <laughs> federal grant project. And our goal was to try and develop assessments of online co reading comprehension in three different formats. And um, I, I have a, a little example to show you in a few minutes. But basically, the three formats are something called ORCA Open, which is the big, bad internet in all its um, assessment challenges where uh, students are actually going out using the real Google search engine and navigating that and finding multiple websites and things like that. The second interface is something called ORCA Closed, where we basically take a set of websites that students might encounter while conducting an inquiry in an open environment and put that into a, a pretty um, high-tech system that we've created that is kind of like a mini internet. And we also have a Google search engine, which um, replicates much of what Google does, but in a, in a smaller way. And then the third format is a multiple choice version. And basically in that, what we did was capture screen captures as students are engaged in the closed version. And then those screen captures are paired with multiple choice items. Um, the goal of the project is not to suggest that one format is better than the other, but to find the most valid and reliable version of each of those three assessments to um, evaluate the practicality of each of those in school districts to try and give schools a model of what uh, assessment might look like that's very much paired to um, authentic types of inquiry for students. 
And can you give us a sense of the types of inquiry that students might do on these one of these three platforms, on the open internet, on the closed internet? What, what kinds of inquiry activities are you asking students to do? And sure. how are you counting uh, what they're actually doing? Yep, let me just, I'm going to show you, I'm going to try to show you a screenshot and we'll see if you can read this. Can you see that screenshot? Okay, so basically yep. this gives you an idea. There, uh, It's a middle school set of inquiry tasks for um, all have to do with human body systems and science. And so there are eight different tasks that we have in each format. Four of them we call learn more about types of tasks where the idea is to gather multiple sources of information that addresses a question such as how can energy drinks affect your heart or um, how does the volume level of mp3 players affect your hearing on the other side we have four types of tasks that uh, require students to investigate conflicting claims and so we purposely set up the scenario to um, either agree or disagree with questions such as does third hand smoke harm your health or can chihuahua dogs cure asthma and so those kinds of uh, examples are, are some of the questions and maybe in a little while depending on where we go I can show you actually I'll just very quickly I know you probably can't see this very closely but what happens in our system is that the questions and the tasks are embedded in a social networking um, Facebook type interface and so the tasks come through this avatar uh, and there's uh, through the comments in the Facebook interface students are given certain tasks then students go out into the internet and toggle back and forth through different websites and return back to the interface to post their responses Awesome. So now we've begun by giving our, um, I think we have maybe as many as 350 or more uh, viewers out there, and we've given you a sense of the exciting uh, two initiatives that we're going to dig in deeply this evening um, by looking at the um, program evaluation strategy for the BTOP initiative and by looking at this uh, ORCA project that's really looking at, rel at developing reliable and valid measures to assess uh, a young people's online reading comprehension skills. So now it's time for us to take a deeper dive on each of these projects. What we're going to do is hear from each of our uh, presenters who are going to share with us a little bit about their methodologies, uh, their instruments, how they operationalize their variables, the approach they're taking to the data analysis. And in this section, we'd like you, our listeners and viewers at, at home, to uh, share your uh, comments and your questions using the uh, Twitter hashtag digilit hashtag digilit12 or using the uh, YouTube or the comment bar at the district dispatch so let's hear from um, Karen Hansen uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the approach that you're taking that your team is taking and that the um, approach to program evaluation Karen and give us a, a sense of the um, the the, the set of decisions you've made about approaching the, um, the federal uh, part of the uh, program evaluation. Thank you. And let me just be, um, just off the bat, make clear that I'm uh, the program manager, but the evaluation is being led and managed and owned by our independent third-party evaluators. But, but my role is really to make sure that whatever information they need from our grantees, whatever information they need about the program can be delivered to them. So just to be clear that it's not, um, we're not doing the evaluation, but we're just, we're, we're part of the process of getting them the information that they need. So I'll first talk about that, um, the evaluation that's being done by ASR Analytics, and then I'm going to give some examples about what our grantees are doing to measure digital literacy within their own grants and in their communities. Um, and please feel free to interrupt if there's any anything you need me to clarify. Um, so the ASR evaluation of the BTOP program is really looking to identify the social and economic impacts of these grants. So what are the 
um, how can we look at what's happening in communities and figure out if educational outcomes were improved or healthcare outcomes were improved or um, quality of life was improved, workforce. So the ASR uh, team is doing a large longitudinal study over the course of the evaluation which will be done by September 2014 and they're also doing some case studies. So they're doing case studies of the um, uh, PCC and SBA grants as well as the infrastructure grants and Marika can send out a link to the website where the interim report is posted but in the meantime I am going to pull up um, my screen and hopefully share it with you. Uh, let's see, share window. Okay, so this is the interim report um, that was just published on our website and I'm going to scroll ahead to the section that talks about um, digital literacy and while I'm scrolling through here, let's see if I can um, get there. So as I said, there are several focus areas that they're looking into. And as one example, here's healthcare. Um, what they did when they looked at the when they went to these case study visits, they looked to develop a taxonomy of the different activities that might be considered to fall in that health category. So we're getting to digital literacy. Okay, here we go. Digital literacy. Um, so they did a lot of literature review to pull up information about digital literacy and statistics. And then when they went to these grantees to um, assess what they were doing to improve the digital literacy of their communities, they named these six different types of activities that they would consider to be evidence of activities that are supporting digital literacy. Um, on the right side of this column, you can see that they've categorized the, the types of social and economic benefits that might flow to individuals, to communities, as well as to businesses. So starting with individuals, um, increased job opportunities, increased economic security, um, increased participation in community life, etc. So the point of this is just to show that in addition to looking into these other focus areas that are education, healthcare, workforce, um, quality of life, our evaluators are looking at digital literacy as its own um, as its own topic and trying to name what are the types of activities that um, they would consider to be digital literacy. So that then, when they can look for social economic benefits that flow from those activities, they can they can point to that as having been the result of increased digital literacy. Can I ask you a question about that, Karen? So sure. then, is the idea behind this that the um, the uh, program managers of the individual projects will essentially self-report, we think we're meeting these objectives, or will the clients uh, who are using the computer centers and the facilities, will they be the ones from whom data is collected. So essentially I'm trying to understand, especially complicated, trying to measure the social and economic impact of these programs. At what locus uh, are you, are we measuring this program? At the individual level or at the at the program manager level? Who's essentially com uh, com uh, 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 creating the data? Right, that's a, that's a good question. So um, as I said, there are 15 case studies that are being done of the grantees that are in that public computer center sustainable broadband adoption mix. So ASR is going to go to them twice. They've already been once, which is how they developed this framework. And they're going back actually pretty soon. It's January through April for their second site visits, where they'll be able to do um, essentially a bit of a pre and post um, assessment of, of what transpired. Um, to the extent that those grantees themselves were collecting data um, about individual impacts, they will certainly share that. Um, but it is it is part of the the nature of this of the challenge of this of this evaluation that they couldn't they couldn't do an individual you know 
uh, assessments across the entire portfolio. But so the case studies we, we expect will give a flavor for what's happened in each of those 15 um, grant sites. Um, and you know there are and if you if you read the report further there's what what they're calling the roadmap is what they're going to be looking for in the second case study visits and they're also they also identify all the different grantees that have that are conducting their own evaluations so they will be in get, getting that input into their data set and then using that um, in their assessment but i have i have actually some i think maybe more relevant um, examples to share from some of our grantees. Um, so if you'd like, I can I can uh, go to there. Um, and actually, let me see, Marika, there you're looking for the link to the report. Um, I can, I believe it was in the document that I sent to you. Um, so maybe we can, you can find it in that document. Um, Right, so there was a link that said it's the announcement of the report that was published on the NTIA website. So the first bullet says sh link to ASR report on NTIA. There you go. <laughs> okay, so, um, so what I'd like to do now is talk briefly about one of our grantees, um, which is the C.K. Blandon Foundation. Um, and I'm going to try to pull up this website that's really interesting. Uh, okay, it's it's the North Star Online Digital Literacy Assessment tool. It's it's a module. Can you see that? We can see that. Okay, great. So one of the challenges for the grantees that are operating programs is how do you ask someone what their digital literacy is? Um, so, and a lot of times if you ask somebody, um, what's a mouse, uh, they, or tell me what a mouse is, they might not be able to do so, but if they had something visual like this, where I hope you can see as it's going to launch the module, um, it's actually, oh, <laughs> it's actually going to give you, give us, did you hear that piano? <laughs> we did, we okay. did. So, as you can, uh. I guess I probably shouldn't go through that whole module, but the point is that it's it's a it's a real time uh, way that people can sit down and actually go through each of those different components to self assess what their own digital literacy is. So can they can they adjust the volume on their computer to make sure that they can hear the piano? Do they know where the button is? to turn the computer off or on. Can they, do they know how to adjust the, the mouse buttons so that they can use a left click or a right click? So it's, it's really a, a hands-on uh, tool that, that some of our grantees are using to help um, their communities do self-assessments of what their digital literacy is. Interesting, and of course it's certainly the case that you can't take advantage of any of the social or economic impacts of um, digital media unless you have those fundamental usage skills and those usage skills are sort of necessary but not sufficient uh, prerequisites um, to beginning to take advantage of the power of broad broadband and so in some ways that idea of having a self-assessment or a self-diagnostic is really um, a, a really a useful thing. I guess maybe now at this point we can have a little conversation about how the lessons learned from the program evaluation and the VTOP initiative might be applicable to librarians and information professionals working in academic libraries or school libraries or public libraries. How might they benefit from some of the knowledge gained through your initiative, Karen? Well, I, I think what we're trying to do is, and what ASR is going to do, is lay out the framework for where can you identify the potential benefits. And so once, once you have those, that universe of potential uh, impact in mind, I think it will help uh, communities really tell the story of what's happening. And we have, I have another example in Philadelphia, uh, one of our grantees is actually um, being evaluated by Rutgers, uh, a Rutgers researcher who is doing a 
as we as you point out earlier, he's actually following individuals to find out how their how their individual unique situations changed as they became more digitally literate. So did they were they able to um, complete their high school diploma? Were they able to improve their job situation? Um, but that's obviously going to take it takes money to do an evaluation like that. So at a at a more kind of discrete level, um, there are what were what are, what are called workstation user surveys that have been put on the public computer centers um, computers. And so as soon as someone walks in, it'll launch a um, a survey, either a short form or a long form, to get either demographic data or some more information about what those individuals are there to look for. So I think it's the idea, it's the notion that um, as librarians are seeing more and more people coming in for services, can they get a gauge of why people are coming in? What are the most important elements they're looking for? So that they can then target either the right kind of um, databases to put on their computers? Can they put the right um, portals on their um, on the opening screens to direct people to the resources they're looking for? Um, I think there are all kinds of applications for programming as well as for deciding which classes to, to run and then how to tell the story to ultimately get more support from funders um, and where, where, whoever they may be. Thank, thank you very much for sharing that. I think that's a really interesting and the idea of the workstation user surveys certainly something very applicable, uh, something that librarians could be able to use and install in their own uh, libraries to measure that kind of data. We have a question from one of the almost 470 people who are watching us live tonight. Um, the question is, uh, who generated the text? Taxonomy that Karen is talking about, and what was the argument for behind behind the factors that you decided to measure? As I recall, I think you told us that the taxonomy was developed through a literature review. Mm -hmm. So yes. let's move on to the second question. Uh, what's the argument for why measuring these specific factors? The I I think. Do you mean the five focus? Do you think they mean the five focus areas or probably? Okay, yeah, so th I think those are really what uh, a lot of the, the community that's studying the impact of broadband looks at. You know, where are the, where's the biggest bang for the buck for these types of investments in, our, in terms of communities? Um, and so healthcare improvements, um, there are really, really big, really big opportunities for people to save money individually as well as systemically. Um, if you look at uh, workforce, um, the opportunity for someone to improve their own economic situation by expanding their, their geographic reach in the labor market, that's a really big um, opportunity to quantify a benefit to someone and to a community. Um, so those are really widely accepted as, as, as significant areas where you might find social and economic impact. So can I ask you? Can I ask you a question about that? Sure. So I actually think that's really a great uh, point, which is it's true that if, if broadband, if providing broadband opportunities to all Americans has um, any impact, it, we're hoping it has some impact on um, healthcare, on the workforce, on uh, uh, engaged participation in the community. But are those are those outcomes um, the appropriate? Um, outcomes, given the how new the project is, the 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 um, mm -hmm. the my understanding is it's only been within the last two years that uh, people in uh, these communities have had access to the technology. Um, are we likely to see a measurable impact in such big impacts after just such a short period of time? That's a really big challenge. Um, the The time frame for the study is um, potentially not going to show the ultimate impact from these investments. So that is a risk um, that that we're well aware of. Um, we've We've heard stories, we've heard analogies to when the um, uh, when computers and and information technology was first being rolled out, people were people really, there was no way that they could possibly, quantify 
the impact, the ultimate impact on productivity. Um, but of course, now looking back 25 years later, you say, well, of course. I mean, computers have, have had a huge impact on productivity. So I think there is a, um, and that is what, what economists say. You know, they say that how can you possibly fully quantify the impact of, of the enabling impact of broadband? Um, sure. on healthcare. So it is a risk, but I think what ASR is trying to do is lay a bit of that foundation, lay that framework, and perhaps the data that they're gathering now will be um, the type of data that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, um, will be able to have been shown to be you know, the tipping point in terms of some of these productivity gains or healthcare gains or, or whatnot. Absolutely. So thank you so much for giving us a uh, sharing. I think there's lots that librarians can appreciate. One thing I, I especially appreciate about your work is that you recognize the power of the case study um, as a form of preliminary evidence for addressing these important issues. It's, it's perhaps the case that we won't be able to document um, fully the long-term impact in just this short uh, with this many, many programs uh, in many different cities all across the United States. Um, but setting up that taxonomy of potential impacts and then using case studies, 15 case studies at two points in time, that seems to be a creative and powerful form of program assessment that I think will add a lot of new knowledge to the field. So now we're going to turn to look at um, the work of Julie Quiro. For those of you who turned uh, tuned in a little bit late, Julie Quiro has been involved in for the last four years in a federally funded uh, research study designed to develop reliable and valid measures of um, ad of adolescents' online reading comprehension. Her uh, research model defines digital literacy in terms of five elements, um, being able to identify information, locate, identify a, a research question, locate information and evaluate it, synthesize it, and then communicate it. Um, Julie, can you give us a, um, a deeper dive into the methodology of your research, into the variables you're measuring, and the approach you're using to measure digital literacy? Sure. Um, just a little, uh, just a minute of background about the rationale for this work. And I'm going to put up a slide here. Uh, actually, let me just, just so you can um, see the two types of assessments that I'm talking about. Uh, internationally, there are two other assessments that we're aware of that assess these digital literacies, if you will. One is the PISA, which um, most people are probably familiar with, and there is a digital reading assessment component of the 2011 version of that. And the second uh, assessment is one um, piece of the International Assessment of Adult Competencies, or called the PIAC, uh, and both of those are sponsored and funded by OECD. And the challenges of both of those assessment systems are that they take place in a very tightly restricted information space both in types in terms of the types of responses primarily multiple choice types of assessments and the number of websites that are available are usually limited to one or two that the uh, test takers if you will navigate and try to make sense of the other um, downside of those assessments is that they represent this process of online research primarily as a set of very discrete and unrelated sets of tasks and that really has to do with the notion of assessment and the idea of items being independent from one another and so I bring that up only um, to give you a sense of where we started in terms of why we wanted to do something different and so our interface really was designed to do a few things one we wanted to provide a sense of authenticity where an inquiry task really goes from start to finish it's not a set of small tasks well look at this website and then well let's go evaluate something else uh, we also wanted to tap into the social networking spaces that seem to engage middle school and high school students so much and so we chose a Facebook type of interface um, where students engage and interact with an avatar who's also a student and the prompts come forward to them in terms of here's the question that we're trying to solve and this is what I'd like you to do and so I'm going to jump back to the screenshots for just a second and I know that um, 
the information is kind of small, but I do, I'm going to skip for just a second. Just so you can see, the first idea is that in this Facebook uh, context, we have them access an email message that is sent from the school board administrator um, asking for help in learning more about having energy drinks at school. And so we need you to do research on the issue of how energy drinks affect heart health. When you're done with your research, send Mrs. Marin an email. So we're really asking them to be able to access email information, um, navigate through email lists, and find relevant kinds of information. So at that point, this just gives you an idea of what the interface looks like and the next task is asking them to find a particular article with this title that was published on this date and so they make use of either the in the open the Google search engine or in the close the Google search engine and we get uh, assess them on their ability to generate appropriate search terms we assess them on their ability to sift and scan through um, relevant and irrelevant websites through a search engine um, whether or not they skip past the advertising. In this next screen here, the ability to take notes and um, represent just the important information. The assessment does not allow them to copy paste and it also um, has a minimal amount of space. When we started this, we were finding that students would just copy paste the whole page and try to put it in the box. And so we, you know, made the um, the website notepads much smaller so that they were asked to really synthesize the most important ideas and so you can see the notepad has four different places and so they're asked to find four different websites uh, some that we explain exactly what we want them to find and others that are more open-ended along the way we also make use of the chat feature in the Facebook interface to ask them all of the reading to evaluate questions and I'm sure you can't see the text here but you can see on the right hand side that these websites are designed to look exactly like the websites in the real open internet they have advertising sometimes there's multiple hyperlinks to follow but on the left hand side <clears throat> there's a sequence of questions that for example asks us uh, can you tell us who the author of this website is? Is this person an expert on the topic of energy drinks or heart health and how do you know? What is the author's point of view and how does that point of view affect the words and images that are used at this site? And then all that information gets compiled together for them to be able to answer the question, is the information at this website reliable? So they're navigating through multiple uh, websites critically evaluating the information and this is not the best example but this is an example of the evidence that seventh graders were able to provide or the lack thereof um, as they tried to explain back to the school board member uh, why or why not should energy drinks be included in school um, and so I'll bring you just through uh, a couple other things just so you get a sense of, of what the interface looks like um, and I'm going to skip this for just a moment and bring you just to the multiple choice version. You can see the screenshots look exactly the same, but what happens is on the left hand side, they now have a multiple choice ABCD choice to submit, and on the right hand side, we put letters in to signify or to point their attention to certain places on the website. So we found results wise that the multiple choice tends to be a little easier because they don't have to generate or necessarily uh, sift through as much information. They just have to look for um, particular kinds of tools. Uh, and so again, I'll just... So wait a second, wait a second. That's yes. a really interesting point. So so are you just saying that you basically you, you began with this very naturalistic inquiry oriented um, task right that moved students through the five processes of um, uh, identify their question uh, locate information evaluate information and then what you found is that um, actually there's a lot of task demand on a kid who's only what 
12 years old so that you then modified the test to include the multiple choice function essentially to reduce the task demand on the child but it was equally valid even though it was less um, well less and that's that's the challenge is you've got from an assessment perspective both reliability and validity and so clearly the multiple choice version is the easiest to score it can be scored automatically and it's the most reliable in terms of validity that's another issue and so what we're trying to do is to say okay well we recognize that the multiple choice version may not be as valid and authentic as the whole process however there's some advantages to a multiple choice assessment in terms of it only takes about 20 minutes I can get a pretty quick idea of what students know if we understand that it's going to overestimate some of their abilities it can at least give us some initial diagnostics and so again there's there's we didn't design the multiple choice to be easier we tried as much as possible to create parallel types of difficulty but the very nature of a multiple choice question reduces the task demands in so many ways um, you you don't have to you're not lost in irrelevant material um, you don't have to even the interface you don't even have to navigate around and find space on your desktop to put all these multiple websites it's just there <laughs> and so but in some ways what that means is that you have kind of protected from the floor right so kids can't completely fall through the cracks here you're kind of creating a floor where you can kind of your kids aren't gonna kids are gonna be able because the task is a bit easier kids are more likely to be able to do something rather than do you know kids who are really struggling just fall apart yes and that's really what we see in the open environment which is really the most authentic environment and what we see when we go out and, and watch students is <laughs> many students are lost from the get-go um, they put in the search terms that aren't necessarily effective and they're off on another direction and so in terms of being able to sift and sort and evaluate just sheer relevancy they're gone and their opportunity to even get back into the tasks to complete the rest are they they can't do it and so what happens is they get a lot of zeros <laughs> mm -hmm. now we have built into the system we understand that it really isn't fair to say well if you can't find the website you don't have any critical evaluation skills and so we built into the system uh, uh, and the avatar reminder that says well you've got about two more minutes here and if you can't find the website we've got somebody who may have found a website that might help ah. you. and so then they get to the website and then we they get a, a score for zero for the locating but right. now we can even find out do they have some of those critical evaluation skills right. and so we're, we're seeing right. differences um, you know in in terms of seeing reading as a series of components rather than just decoding um, and some students are strong on some pieces and not strong at all on the others um, so the last thing I'll mention um, is just in terms of the communications we I don't know if I have a screenshot here let me just I may have a screenshot of the wikis yes some of our tasks involve email questions let me put this up real quick and others of our tasks ask students to visit a wiki space that we created and I know that these items are very very small but in the right hand side you see the beginnings of a wiki and the four questions that they need to develop or answer is the first where would you even put the information that you want to post now that you found it second what heading should you use that's most relevant and fits with the discourse of this particular right. wiki space third how might you begin your entry and fourth how might you complete the entry with relevant details that support your claims and arguments and so it, it's it's much more generative there's lots of rooms to students to not do well <laughs> and so even in the multiple choice version we're seeing 
opportunities that some students have and, and other students just aren't prepared to know how to handle So Julie, we're getting a lot of questions from the more than 470 folks who are watching us live this evening to share with us some of the results. You've been gathering data from 11 and 12 year olds and many of the folks in our audience have a direct interest in either that particular population or in other people uh, who may have low literacy skills uh, not dissimilar from that from a middle school student. Can you share with us some findings as you have begun to identify what skills middle school students have in identifying a problem, uh, locating information, evaluating it, synthesizing it, and then communicating a message to an audience? Sure. Uh, some of the things that we're finding are critical evaluation, no surprises, very, very difficult for many students. And um, we haven't done the analyses yet because we're, we're, we've just now finished developing it after three years of, of testing. Um, but our plan is also to correlate their performance in an online environment with their reading and writing performance in an offline environment. And we have results. Wait, wait, wait. Um, wait, yeah. wait, 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 wait. Why are you doing that? Ah, well, from previous work, and that's really where our, all of our work started, found that performance and online comprehension is, in some cases, not at all correlated in the ways that we would expect with performance in an offline kind of a reading test. And so, um, in fact, we're finding some students who are very high performers offline are very low performers online and typically those are students who have a lot of background knowledge who are strong in terms of decoding and maybe even critical thinking but they don't have the locating skills to be able to find relevant websites and then we're that, all I can't tell you how fascinating that has to be to academic and school and public librarians all over the country and all over the world. Yeah. What you're what you've just said is that essentially it might be that online reading uh, skills are fundamentally different than print literacy skills um, because they might there might be some medium specificity here yeah. right and yeah. and that's actually something that uh, you know in the communication area we've been talking about for about the last 50 years the medium does shape the kinds of cognitive skills that we use in them uh, so the kid even might be a good reader in a print reading context but like you said maybe not have the full panoply of skills mm -hmm. to be effective in the online reading comprehense uh, com yes and, com and we're also reading. We're also finding that some students who are not skilled in an offline world are especially skilled in an online world and those typically are gamers who like to solve problems and see challenges and navigating lots of spaces and so they're really good at locating. They then fall when it gets to the critical thinking. And really, I, I think what that's starting to show us is that we can't make assumptions in that whatever kind of reader or writer students are in, in print kinds of spaces, that that will automatically transfer over. And in many cases, students are struggling no matter what kind of offline reader they are in terms of high levels of critical thinking. Uh, nice. So. Um, um, so we have a couple of questions that I'm hoping that both of our panelists can respond to. Again, uh, we only have about 10 minutes remaining. If you have any questions, we'd like you to tweet your questions or comments. Uh, use the Twitter hashtag uh, Digilit12 um, or use the comment tool in the District Dispatch uh, website to uh, give us your questions. We have one question asking each of the panel members if you could talk to us a little bit about how your work might support our exploration of um, the digital literacy skills that college students need. Karen, can you think about how some of the competencies that uh, you're measuring uh, with the um, program evaluation in the BTOP grant might be applicable to the digital literacy skills that college students need? Um, well, one thing that comes to mind is um, civic participation, perhaps. Um, that's one of the other focus areas that the ASR evaluation is looking at, and they've defined some of the taxonomy. Um, the taxonomy defines what they, what they would consider to be civic engagement. Um, I, 
I'm not quite sure that anything else is springing to mind at the moment from our other grantee portfolio, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll think about that. I'll see if, if uh, Julie has anything to add, and I'll, I'll do some doodling. Okay, Julie, what, what, how might, uh, you, you're, you're teaching undergraduates, and you're designing a reliable and valid instrument for 12-year-olds. What is the uh, insights that your work has for those of us who are working with college students to develop their digital literacy skills? I think one of the things that I'm seeing quite often with college students is the challenge in dealing with information about conflicting claims. They're not quite able to handle, well, wait a minute, this website says one thing and this website says another, completely different thing. And their immediate reaction is to think that one is bogus and one is not. And so the idea of ideas on a continuum is really, a, 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 seems to be a novel concept. Um, and so the other thing that goes along with that is when they get search results, typically middle school, high school, and college students tend to come to their searches with their hypothesis or their beliefs, and they use the internet to find more stuff that supports their beliefs. And the, the challenge of having students develop search queries that actually locate information that's opposite of their beliefs in order to get a more well-rounded global understanding of an idea is really, really hard, but I think um, it's really important. And so that's why even at the middle school level, we've tried to point them to at least two conflicting claims, both sides of the issue, if you will, and then ask them to kind of put themselves, where do they sit? And it's totally okay if they're not at either end to introduce the idea that there's actually more than two positions that you can take. So I would say conflicting claims and then locating information that's different than what you already come knowing are, are really challenging for all students. Boy, that is, so, thank you so much for sharing that. Now we only have about eight minutes remaining and one of the ways we thought we might c conclude tonight's uh, program um, is to actually try to create a bit of a wish list. We're so fortunate that there are over 450 uh, um, participants in this hangout who are watching us this evening. Many of those are practitioners, uh, young scholars, uh, and researchers who are um, engaged in a really interdisciplinary collaboration about trying to get our, hand, our hands around this big concept of digital literacy, which includes the skills of being able to use technology tools, to be able to author and create with them, to analyze and evaluate um, messages that come to us, and then to be able to make ethical and social uh, choices in how we use those tools. Um, in a way that's socially responsible and helps um, improve society. If you were to make a wish list of questions you wish were answered and that you know five years from now or even seven years from now we're going to be further along in our learning. We're going to have gained some knowledge. What are the most pressing questions that you wish you had answers to as we engage in this process of trying to understand what digital literacy is and how it impacts individuals, communities, and society. What's on your wish list? Karen? Julie? Karen? <laughs> Oh, that's a big question. Um, I know, it's a wish list though, so just like start at the top and work your way down. What do you wish you knew now that you know you're not going to know for another five or seven years? Oh, I guess for what we're trying to accomplish, um, a lot of it is is what is that spark that really um, makes people realize that the internet and, and digital literacy and broadband is, is relevant. Um, because I think in some ways that's still, it's a very tough, um, for, for those of us who use the internet all the time and have smartphones and can't imagine life without them, um, it's just hard to put ourselves in that mindset of someone who has not yet realized the value or the relevance. And so I think one of the questions that, that I would love to really have answered is what, what does each community that we're trying to reach um, consider to be relevant? Or how can we really frame 
the approach to each of those uh, communities in a way that, that gets them in the door? Um, that would be one of the questions that I would have. I think that is an absolutely awesome question. What is the spark that makes people realize that they need to use <laughs> digital media um, for daily life and for work and for personal development, for social development? That's a great question. I wish we had a better understanding of that question. I hope five years from now we do. Julie, what's one question that you wish we had the answer to and that you think we might be able to answer in five or seven years? I think the question that I'm most interested in is what technologies mediate learning and literacy and what technologies might complicate learning and literacy and are those the same technologies that maybe are used with different practices or you know are, are they different types of technologies you know so part of it is is it the tool that matters and another or or is it the teaching that goes along with it that matters um, but I think recognizing that some things support and mediate learning and some things may complicate learning unless we figure out a way to um, address some of the challenges. I, I think that's going to be important as we start to just select technologies and use them with students. I, I want to make sure that we're doing things that are actually going to help and support and facilitate learning rather than make it more complicated. If I could I jump onto that because I think um, a very similar question is is the smartphone um, a gateway to greater digital literacy and greater learning and desire um, to become more digital liter digitally literate, or is it becoming a substitute? I, I personally think that um, that it's not a substitute for uh, you know true access to a computer and to the internet to broadband. But I think a lot of folks are starting to think, well, it's okay because these communities have access to smartphones. Um, so I think that's a question. And I would also just want to make a quick plug. Um, at NTIA, we're developing a broadband adoption toolkit at the moment, and it's going to be released in January, which will have some of those, um, what are some of those sparks that have worked to really get people excited about um, becoming digitally literate. So that's one thing that's coming down the pike. Uh, Okay, so in fact, um, actually, what a great way to conclude. We conclude with um, one, two, three really powerful questions that we hope the young researchers and practitioners in the world of library and information studies, in the world of education, in the world of communication and media studies, that we, that we think are really vital questions for the next five or, or ten years. What is the spark that makes people realize that digital media is relevant and important to their personal and social and occupational development? Um, it, what technologies mediate or complicate the literacy learning process and what do we need to know about what the tools can do and what the instructional practices can do um, because um, unintended consequences of technology is something we all understand really well and we're just at the place of discovery trying to understand what are the uh, optimal uh, learning outcomes and what are some unintended uh, and potentially uh, disadvantageous uh, um, uh, side effects and finally this very provocative question about the smartphone. Is it a gateway to increased, increasing people's digital literacy competencies and, and, and their ability to be both authors and consumers of uh, media and information? Or is it a substitute uh, for them uh, using the, the full panoply of tools and technologies that are available to them in the digital media environment? three really great questions for us to conclude. So this evening I want to thank our panel members for uh, sharing their expertise with us. Uh, we've been delighted to welcome Karen Hansen, Program Officer for the National Telecommunications Information Administration, part of the Department of Commerce. She's responsible for program evaluation of the BTOP Federal Initiative, um, and that's the initiative that's bringing broadband uh, technology um, to underserved communities all across the United States. And Dr. Julie Quiro, a professor in the School of Education at the University of Rhode Island, whose expertise in online reading comprehension has enabled her to uh, work with colleagues to develop a reliable and valid measure for uh, understanding online reading comprehension, including those vital skills of um, identifying an information problem, uh, locating information,
critically analyzing that information, synthesizing uh, learning, and then communicating it to a real audience. My name is Renee Hobbs. I'm the OITP 2012 Fellow, and this is actually my concluding uh, my concluding event for my wonderful year with the American Library Association. I'm so grateful to my friends uh, at the American Library Association and to, at, to OITP for giving me the opportunity to learn more about librarians, librarianship, and digital literacy. Thanks to all of you for joining uh, this evening, and we do uh, invite you to continue the conversation using our Twitter hashtag, Digilit12. Thanks again for joining us. We'll all wave goodbye now. Goodbye, and thank Bye. you for joining us. Thanks to Marika Visser and Lara Clark for coming up with this great idea for a Google Hangout. We're really grateful for your leadership and support. Marika and uh, Lara, thanks so much for uh, making this event possible. Good night. Good night.